Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Today we begin with livestock feeding options for this time of year with our Extension Beef Cattle Specialist, Dave Lawman. Their calves were weaned about a month and a half ago. Um, so they've just been maintained in the dry lot to get them off of the pasture. And so we thought maybe producers might like to hear a little more about that program because it's an option to you know, maybe run more cows on the same acreage uh, in times of drought, maybe give your pastures relief uh, from grazing pressure. Um, and also feed grain is relatively inexpensive now. And so from a cost standpoint, it's relatively inexpensive to maintain cows using a more of a concentrate type feeding program. So specifically, what is the feed formula that you have set up for this group? These cows are getting a diet <clears throat> that's about 30% chopped hay. Um, it's about 58% wet corn gluten feed, a product called Sweet Bran, and then uh, about 12% cracked corn. And that's all on a dry matter basis. In terms of the cost, this formula that you mentioned is a pretty decent option right now given grain prices. Yes, ma'am. It's right now the cost on this diet is about $160 a ton. Uh, so we've got these cows, since they're in the second stage of gestation, which is the period of time in their production cycle when their requirements are at their lowest, they're only getting about 11 pounds of dry matter a day. And so the cost on that is, is about 88 cents a day. And that's only the feed cost, but, uh, but it's relatively inexpensive. And from the best I can tell, they seem to be in pretty good condition. They're doing very well. And, you know, <clears throat> normally you would think that with nice quality hay, I'd say a 1,200 pound cow would consume about 2% of her body weight in dry matter. And so that's around 24 pounds of hay. But with this concentrated diet, meaning concentrated nutrients, uh, you don't need to feed that much. And so 11 pounds is, as you can see, maintaining their body condition really well. Okay, some great options for producers to think about. Dave Lawman, thanks a lot. We'll Thank see you. you again soon. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. Our weather over Thanksgiving added quite a twist in this year's celebration. Even as late as Wednesday afternoon, there were still 15,300 reported electrical outages in Oklahoma. Hopefully you and your family came through without too much ice damage or disruption. Wednesday afternoon, the Mesonet had some of its last ice melt collected in the rain gauges. The gauge locations close to Interstate 40, Elk City, Bessie, Weatherford, and Hinton recorded between three and four tenths of an inch. Arnett and Woodward Mesonet sites collected more than four tenths of an inch. Tuesday, December 1st was the first afternoon with warm air temperatures across the state. The lowest afternoon air temperature on Tuesday was 47 degrees in the southeast corner and way out west in the Panhandle. The warmest afternoon maximum was 56 degrees. So how did we settle out on moisture from all of the rain and ice over this year's Thanksgiving holiday? A seven-day rainfall map from November 25th through December 2nd has three main bands across the state. The blue-colored areas in the Panhandle came in under an inch of water. Areas in the green band that went from the edge of the Panhandle to a line from Vanita to Cushing to Chickasha to Walters ranged from two to four inches of precipitation. East of that line was the yellow, orange, and red bands going from areas with more than four inches to a peak of nine and eighty-five hundredths inches of rain collected at Hugo. As you can guess, all of that collected precipitation pushed our soil moisture levels up. A map from December 1st shows most Oklahoma locations with close to 100% of their plant available water from the surface down to 16 inches. Only three locations were below 90%, 
Buffalo, Cherokee, and Fort Cobb. Adding in the deeper soil depths, a map of plant available water from the surface to 32 inches, we still see a lot of locations with 100% of their plant available water. But Buffalo comes in at 53%, Fairview at 59%, Breckenridge at 58%, and Lake Carl Blackwell at 54%. These lower percentages come from deeper, drier soils. For the month of November, all mesonet sites came in above their 15-year average for total rainfall for November. Boise City was only a quarter inch above their long-term average rainfall. Mount Hermon had over 11 inches above its November average rainfall. The 15-year average November rainfall amounts range from 39 hundredths of an inch at Kenton to 3 and 89 hundredths inches at Idabel. A number of places in eastern Oklahoma had close to 300% of their average rainfall this November. November's above average rainfall pushed Oklahoma out of drought designation. The light yellow areas in the southwest and north central portions of Oklahoma indicate only abnormally dry status, no drought. It sure feels good to enter winter with lots of moisture and to say goodbye once again to drought in our state. Thanks for joining us for this edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. Joining us now is Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist. And Kim, good news to end the week, wheat prices a little bit higher. Yeah, we got a good rally in the wheat market. Uh, we got a 10 cent higher increase in the futures market than, than we did in the cash prices because some elevators in Oklahoma lowered their basis by 10 cents and that lowered the cash price 10 cents. Not overall, we still got a price rally, but it's 10 cents less than we got in the futures. And Let's talk globally now. How are those world conditions for crops looking? If you look at the uh, 2016 crop conditions uh, in, Ukraine, in the Ukraine, there's uh, ten, you know, less planted acres. Uh, it's not in very good conditions. There's some potential uh, production decisions in the, in the former Soviet Union countries and in Russia. Uh, you look at the U.S. crop, though, the winter wheat crop, it looks like it's in relatively good condition. As far as uh, planted acres in Oklahoma, it's hard to tell, but probably right now the estimate's going to be slightly less for both the soft red and the hard red winter wheat and probably equal to slightly higher in Oklahoma. With some of that in mind, where do you think prices then will go from here? Well, I think prices, say, between now and, and early January, we're going to get some rallies like we did this last week. Uh, there's not much volume in the market during this holiday time period. You'll get some producers that'll come in and be selling some wheat off to get the, the Christmas money. You won't have the buyers on the other side, and so you'll get the, uh, the price rallies or the price declines. I think we've got to wait till in January to see where prices will be, and that, that early January price will set the stage for the 2016 year. As we look into harvest, that July contract, KC contract, is 20 cents higher than the March contract. I think that's good news. And if you look at the basis that's being offered, if you're off the March contract for current uh, prices, you got about a 60 cent to 70 cent under basis. But if you look at July 16th, you've got a, a 32 of 45 cent basis. So you've got 20 cent higher futures price, you got a 20 cent lower uh, basis. It gives you about 40 cents premium as you're looking out to July versus now. And so semi-optimistic for prices. With that in mind, your advice for producers this time of year? Well, producers that are, that are holding the wheat, it's just to flip the coin whether to sell it or not. I do think we're on the floor. Uh, all the bad news is in the market. And I did, uh, the other thing that happened this last week is the value of the dollar decreased by a couple points. I think that was another reason we saw some of that price rally. Uh, if, if that dollar's peaked out, if we, I think we've got all the bad news in the market. You know, Argentina with uh, doing away with their export uh, tax at 25% that makes their uh, wheat cheaper on the market. I think all the negative news is in. I'm really just cautiously optimistic about prices as we go into the year and as we get into the next harvest. Okay, we'll take it. Kim Anderson, thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. 
Here we are the first week in December and Josh, the canola plants are still growing, but for how long will this be going on? Uh, if, if they're still growing, they don't have a whole lot left in them. Yeah. Um, we see that uh, the, a lot of the crop this year looks really good compared to what we've had uh, the last couple years. Uh, the crop has got a lot, of, a lot of vegetative growth, a lot of leaf matter, getting a, a lot of good bases or crowns developed to them. Um, the crop's looking real good, so we're starting to get questions of, is it looking too good? Do right. we have too much growth? Or what are these freezes going to do to a canola crop that's grown excessively compared to what we've had in the last couple years. Well, and in the past couple of years, we've had those sharp freezes. I mean, it, it would be 70 degrees one day and then 17 at night. We really haven't had those those freezes this year. Yeah, and it's it's actually been very beneficial for the crop. We've we've gotten down to freezing or slightly above freezing. This last weekend, uh, majority of the state got below freezing, but it wasn't 17, it was 27 or 25 or, you know, those just below freezing if you will. Um, what that's allowed the, the crop to do is begin to shut down slowly mm -hmm. and start to begin to, it's almost like you're closing a restaurant. We're, we're, we're cleaning things up, yep. we're closing things down instead of a fire just kind of sweeping us out of the, the, the place. So it's, it's allowed that crop to slowly shut down instead of have to shut down within 24 hours. Now let, let's talk about the plant as it does shut down. What, what, what are we seeing? Yeah, like I said, we have a lot of growers that uh, like we have a, a crop here that's very symbolic of what we see across the state. It's got a lot of vegetative mass to it. Um, we like to see about six or seven leaves. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the times we're seeing a lot more right. and, and we see here it's, it's well spread out. These leaves are starting to look like they're ornamentals and not really a crop. So we're starting to see a lot of vegetative growth. But what you have to do is actually look below the vegetative growth and down here because because this or this growing point or this crown region as well as this this stem, this lower stem region are what helps us survive the winter. And if we have good development here, this is what's going to help us survive. And that's actually what those early freezes, slightly after planting, we don't have enough time to develop this region and we don't have those, those sugars, carbohydrates, and sucrose to get that crop uh, throughout the rest of the winter. Now the big thing about growth is that uh, good vegetative growth can be a good thing. What you don't want is this growing point or what we call it the crown mm -hmm. to get too high above the soil surface. That soil surface almost serves as insulation. Mm -hmm. the, the wheat residue, if you're no-till or if you're, you're planted in a sorghum or, some, or, or corn, that also helps us insulate the ground and insulate this crop a little bit. So what we don't want is this to grow too high above the soil surface. And we see here we see exactly where the soil line was. It's, it's white, it's fleshy, that doesn't have a whole lot of green matter to it. And we only have about a half inch to three quarters of an inch above the soil surface. That's, a, that's getting a little high, but that's still okay. Um, a lot of times in no-till because of the uneven emergence, or if you plant too high of populations, the plants just simply outcompete with each other. And then we start to see these crowns develop at an inch to two inches to maybe even worst case scenarios, three inches above the soil surface and what you do is you're just raising that growing point out that sensitive part into the plant up into these environmental conditions we want them to to hug the ground and stay as close to the ground as we possibly could best case scenario you can't even tell where the soil ends and the plant begins and, and by the way you guys have a, a, a school coming up here pretty quick the crop the cropping school yeah we got a winter crop school it's coming up in about two weeks the the 15th the Tuesday is gonna be a all-day event and then we got a half day on Wednesday so that's the 15th and the 16th. It's open to everybody. Um, there are CCA or those continuing education credits available. It's, uh, I do believe it's uh, $125. You can either go to uh, wheat.okstate.edu or you can register there at the door. We'd like you to pre-register, but if you register at the door, we're, we're not going to turn you away. And it's going to be really good. We're going to have uh, topics that range from pasture management, wheat management, uh, a lot of summer crop management, this year looking at soybeans uh, we got a great speaker coming in talking about sugarcane aphids so oh, if wow. you had sugarcane aphids this year got a good guest lecturer coming in uh, from Louisiana talking about sugarcane aphids and where the Mid-South and the Southeast has kind of been very successful at managing them how they've done it well thank you very much Josh and we will put a link to that on our website sunup.okstate.edu
Joining us now is Daryl Peel, our Livestock Marketing Specialist. And Daryl, this past week, Oklahoma saw its first round of winter weather. How's that impacting cattle and then the markets? Well, I think, you know, it, it certainly creates a lot of management headaches. So, uh, as usual, we had a wide range of impacts uh, in terms of flooding conditions in some areas where it didn't freeze. And, and then we had a lot of freezing rain and, uh, and those cold conditions in other areas. The market impacts probably won't be too significant this first storm. It looks like we're going to warm up here afterwards, uh, but cattle were not really prepared for winter. They don't have a winter coat on, and when it comes as freezing rain, they get wet, they're cold, and there is a significant drain on, on performance on those cattle initially. So we could see some impact on the fed cattle markets as a result of, of these animals uh, you know, going off feed a little bit here. And then in terms of the market, it's not just the weather that makes this time of year, December especially, sort of interesting and sometimes challenging? You know, it's, it's tough to really get a, a beat on the market, especially with all the volatility we've had in cattle markets in recent weeks. Um, you know, we're in this sort of, you know, middle of holiday season kind of thing. It's really hard to establish a market trend here at the end of the year. And, and I think it'll be very difficult to get a bead on cattle markets here at the end of the year, uh, both cattle and beef markets. And so uh, we're, we're probably just gonna kind of uh, move our way out through the end of the year and, and really wait until we get into early next year before we really get a strong sense of the market. Is that wait and see the kind of approach that you're giving to producers right now as they kind of start planning for the year end and the year ahead? Well, to some extent, I think, you know, this has been a year of transition. Again, we've had lots of volatility, uh, kind of a lot of change in psychology in the market in the last few weeks. I think producers need to think through, uh, you know, that we're in a, a little different environment. Uh, we're still going to have relatively strong cattle prices, but clearly we're in a situation now where animal numbers are growing, beef production is going to begin to grow next year, and, and producers are going to be in a, over time, a, a, a lower price environment. So this is the time to think about that. In the shorter run here, the cold weather really is, is more of a management issue than it is a marketing issue. And so I think producers really need to be, uh, you know, geared up for taking care of the cattle, uh, continuing to do any marketing. We have a little bit of calf marketing yet to go here uh, in early December, and, and uh, this weather has made that a bit of a challenge. So we need to take care of that stuff as we finish up the year. Okay, terrific advice. Daryl Peel, thanks a lot. We'll see you again soon. Many times on the cow-calf corner, we've talked about the importance of body condition of cows, especially young cows at calving time, and how that influences uh, the reproductive performance the following year. I like to uh, think of body condition scoring as an estimate of the amount of fat that's on the cow's body. And the way we do that is by looking for the uh, flesh actually between the hide and the skeletal system uh, to uh, determine whether uh, we can uh, see the particular outlines of bones such as ribs or such as the uh, transverse processes along the edge of the loin uh, showing up very prominently or is there a matter of uh, some adipose tissue or fat tissue that has uh, developed and grown in between the hide and the skeletal structure. I really uh, am concerned about the scores of four, five, and six on our one through nine scale because I think that's where all the action is. Four is a little too thin, five's okay for adult cows, and six is our target then for uh, first calf heifers. Fatter than that we don't need, and certainly thinner than fours are not going to perform very well. How do I determine the difference between a four and a five? Well, I think if you'll look at uh, this particular drawing, you can see where I really spend my time uh, looking at the cow to see if I can see the outline of the transverse processes. Those are those uh, bones that stick out straight towards you right in front of the hook bone or the hip bone. And if we can see the outline of those, then I know she's not fleshy enough to be in a body condition score five category. Also, I look at the rib cage. If I can see the outline of three or more ribs on the last half of the rib cage, I know that she's probably too thin to be in a body condition score five or six category, so she's going to be a four or, or even lower. Now as we follow up, uh, let's take a look at uh, some cows. Uh, this is a body condition score four cow, one that I think is just too thin to be in a, a proper body condition at calving time. It points out the point that 
that uh, in the winter time we're going to have to look through that winter hair coat to identify uh, how much of the skeletal structure we can see. When we get to the body condition score 5 cow, you can see that now she looks smoother across that area right in front of the hook bone. Uh, certainly if we had a summer hair coat on the cow we could probably see the outline of only the last couple of ribs. And then when we follow it up with a body condition score 6, this is a two-year-old heifer, she looks smooth to you. All of those places that we've talked about. Over the hook bone, in front of the hook bone, there's no evidence of seeing those uh, individual processes pointing out towards us. We can't uh, see the outline of, of the ribs and that's a heifer that's in certainly good enough body condition to expect good performance at calving time. If you uh, summarize, or as uh, researchers have done, is summarize all the data that's been done uh, in a number of different experiment stations, what we've found is that uh, cows that calved in a body condition score four or worse uh, in a confined or defined breeding season the next year only rebred at about a 60% rate. Those that were in a body condition score score five rebred at an 80% rate on the average. Those in the sixes were way up there above 90%. So I think that's why we've got to be paying attention to body condition scores. We go through the winter and make sure that our adult cows are at least in a body condition score five and then we want to shoot for that body condition score six for those two-year-old heifers in order to get the kind of rebreed rate the following year that we certainly want and need. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. Now to a conversation about food production and how consumers, opinions, and trends are evolving and maybe starting to shift. Charlie Arnott is the CEO of the Center for Food Integrity a nonprofit that works to build trust in food and agriculture. One of the things that people are confused and concerned about today, particularly those in agriculture, is why do people hate big food? Why do people hate big agriculture? So what we want to be able to do is provide a context for that, really a bit of understanding of why, that, why we got to where we are today. How did we get into the position where people are fundamentally more skeptical about food, despite the fact that it's safer and more available and more affordable than it's ever been before? And then more importantly, what do we do about it? as people involved in agriculture, how can we begin to reshape and change that public conversation about food in such a way that it encourages greater public understanding, which results then in greater public trust. The challenge we have in agriculture, how we got to the point where people are more skeptical is that over the last 45 years, there have been enough violations of public trust by institutions, whether they be government or business or religious or academic institutions, uh, starting with things in 1968 through the Watergate, uh, through Exxon Valdez, through the second president that was uh, uh, impeached but that were not convicted, through the subprime mortgage collapse, that we are fundamentally now more skeptical of institutions than we've ever been before. At the same time, over that last same 45-year period, we've seen consolidation, integration, and application of technology in the food system, which results in food being safer, more available, and more affordable than ever before but it also causes the public to now think about agriculture as an institution, and therefore, like other institutions, perhaps no longer worthy of public trust. So when farmers are faced with those fairly direct, challenging questions, there are a couple of different ways to respond. One would be to respond very directly and to respond to the challenge with information and data, which is only likely to result in the, the questioner becoming more polarized in their opinion, or to really begin to ask some questions and engage in a dialogue. So I hear your concern about antibiotics and I really appreciate you being willing to raise that concern. Tell me some more about why you have that concern. Where did that come from? And then they can tell you a little bit more and ultimately it's likely to boil down to either a mistrust of big agriculture or a greater concern about food safety. That then gives the rancher or farmer the opportunity to engage in that conversation in a much more meaningful way. To be able to have the conversation about his values and to be able to talk about how his values are really aligned with what the consumer wants. That's the kind of relationship that's likely to result in increased trust. One of the great things about working in agriculture and one of the things I really enjoy about it is when you talk about a, people, a group of people that have great values, you aren't going to find a better group of people than farmers and ranchers. They just have fabulous values. Uh, they're deeply committed to doing what's right. We just don't tend to talk about our values very much. 
And so we really need to be much more comfortable talking about our commitment to doing what's right and less about how we do what we do. One way to think about it is that science tells us whether or not we can do something, society tells us whether or not we should. And the questions we're being asked today are all about whether or not we should do what we're doing. Those are values-based questions. So it's really important that we're able to make that values-based connection to help people understand that our systems have changed, but our values have not. That we still have the same kind of values that have made rural Oklahoma strong and will continue to make rural Oklahoma strong in the future. To learn more about the Center for Food Integrity, just go to the SUNUP website. Finally today, we say a fond farewell to an OSU trailblazer, Dr. Charles Browning. The Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources would not be what it is today without the leadership of Dr. C.B. Browning, who served as Dean and Director from 1979 to 1997. Dr. Browning passed away December 1st in Gainesville, Florida at the age of 84. His in-depth vision and work to coordinate education, research, and extension still benefits Oklahomans to this day. Among the many achievements under his guidance, creation of the Oklahoma Agricultural Leadership Program, along with a new animal science building, the OSU Noble Research Center, and the Robert M. Kerr Food and Agricultural Products Center, as well as an increased emphasis on applied and basic research. He won numerous awards, including induction into the Oklahoma Higher Education Hall of Fame in 1997. Dr. Browning's work for the division, the university, and all of Oklahoma leaves a lasting legacy and will live on for generations.